uh, for today is Mir Yosef, who's an assistant professor in the Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science uh, in the Center for Computational Biology at the University of California in Berkeley. Uh, he started there in January of 2014. Uh, prior to that, he got his BS in Computer Science from Ben Gurion University, PhD in Computer Science from Tel Aviv University, and then he did postdocs at Harvard Medical Institute in the Broad, Harvard Medical School in the Broad Institute. Uh, his research interests are in developing computational methods for analyzing diverse high throughput data sets with the goal of better understanding gene regulation in mammalian cells and also dynamic regulatory circuits, focusing on the immune system as a model, which is why we were particularly excited that he was able to join us for this particular summer school. Uh, his, the title of his, his presentation is Reconstructing the TH17 Differentiation Network from Profiles to Drug Targets. All right, good morning, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Yes. All right, so thank you very much for the invitation. I'm really happy to be here uh, and talk about uh, some of the work that we've been doing the past couple of years. So uh, I'm going to start with the motivational slide. Um, so I guess I don't have to say this uh, to you, it's since you are your audience, you care about creating models and stuff, but uh, as a general, uh, we see that uh, high throughput profiling methods are doing exceedingly well in identifying individual components that are important for uh, the various systems that we study. It can be differentially methylated regions in the DNA, it can be differentially expressed genes or whatever. Uh, so we are good in identifying these specific components. But what we don't know, and in, often in order to understand the function of these components, we need to understand how they come together as a system, how they interact with each other and perform some computation, some function that we care about. But this poses some, some great challenges. Um, and the first challenge is how to design experiments, and then how to use these experiments to build uh, these models that connect our components to each other. And, and in this example and throughout my talk, except for one uh, case, uh, the networks that we talk about connect nocturnal regulators to their uh, target genes. So uh, the second challenge, which is even harder, is how to extract from these networks that can often be very, very large, viable hypotheses that we actually uh, want to, to go and to experimentally test later. So basically, the challenge is to understand the function uh, of, these, of, these, uh, of these networks. Uh, and last thing, to make things even more complicated, uh, these kind of networks, especially the central regulatory networks, are far from static. They, they can change, they change between organisms, they change between tissues, they change between cell type, and even within the same cell type, they can rewire over time, and they can even be different between individual cells uh, out of the seemingly homogeneous uh, population of cells. So um, my lab at, uh, at Berkeley uh, um, is focused on this type of analysis, and specifically what we are interested in seeing is how, how can we understand uh, the variation uh, over time, the variation between individual cells, and how can we use this variation in order to say something about how a system is being regulated and, and what is the mechanism behind some phenomenon that we see. Um, and in order to illustrate uh, this kind of work, I'm going to tell you about the work that we did in the past uh, four years. Uh, we focused on a very specific uh, uh, system of T-cells. So um, this is how our story begins. So when our immune system is being uh, challenged by, let's say, by sensing some pathogen, one of the forms of uh, adaptive immune response is the activation of the AEP cells. So when an AEP cell becomes engaged, it can differentiate into one of several cell types where the uh, decision of the differentiation depends on the specific cytokines that are present in the microenvironment of the cell. Now, there are two major arms to this process. One is to, uh, and this is like in a very, very crude term, so one is to T-cells that uh, promote the immune response, and the other one is to T-cells that suppress the immune response and, and promote tolerance. And as you can imagine, the balance between these two arms is, is very important, and any disturbance of this balance can have detrimental clinical effects like various types of autoimmunities or immune deficiencies. So uh, the most recently discovered subset of T-cells in the immunity arm is called TH17 cells. So T17 cells were discovered uh, in not too long ago. They are recently, you know, relatively recently discovered the, the subset of cells. I think it's like 2006. 
I sent her discovery that attracted a lot of attention from the research community because uh, there is an increasing body of evidence that shows that these cells are important for a large number of, of autoimmune diseases. And this is just a short list here, including multiple sclerosis, uh, psoriasis, a, a virus type of IBD, and, and others. And so uh, understanding the process by which a naive T cell can actually differentiate into TH17 cells, that's, it, it's a very important question to us. It has a very, um, uh, I guess, important translational uh, uh, potential to that question, to understanding the mechanism. So uh, what do we know about TH17 differentiation? Well, I guess what did we know when we started this project? So first of all, and importantly, the differentiation process can be induced in vitro. Uh, we already know uh, some of the uh, major factors that, uh, and transition factors that are uh, important in this process, like STAT3 and IRF4 and BATF, the active pioneer factors, and uh, our gamma which is a, a specific to TH17 cells, and it's like a later induced factor in this process. And finally, in, in order for these cells to remain stable, uh, the stability depends on the on signaling through IR23. Um, as, of, as for mechanism behind the balance between uh, inf inflammation and tolerance, uh, so we know two things. One is that there is a mutually a mutual antagonism between our agamati, which is a master regulator of T17 cells, and FOXP3, which is the master regulator of the regulatory T cells. Uh, and this is one fact. The second fact is that T17 cells, under some context, they can produce immunosuppressive cytokines like IL-10 and be less pathogenic. Uh, but despite these, these, uh, these uh, uh, anecdotal uh, you know, uh, uh, facts that we know about TH17 cells, there is still very partial knowledge uh, about the mechanism behind TH17 differentiation. So what we set up to do in this project is to basically, we have this big goal in our, in our head, which is uh, to create a model of the transcriptional regulatory network that controls TH17 differentiation. And what does that mean? So we start with mechanistic questions very basic mechanistic questions, like who are the key players in this process? And who do they interact with and when do, they, and when do these interactions actually occur? And maybe most importantly, which perturbations can we do in order to disturb the differentiation process? And in, with these mechanistic uh, questions uh, uh, answered, or at least we have hypotheses for them, we can start thinking about higher level functional questions, like how is the balance maintained between inflammation uh, and tolerance? What's the mechanism? Or uh, how is the pathogenic potential of TH17 cells uh, is regulated, for example, through uh, IL-10 production? Or what makes these cells stable? Uh, and then with these functional uh, questions uh, answered, we can start thinking about applications and see if the mechanisms that we identify can highlight a potential good uh, drug targets. So uh, we have four stories that we uh, kind of walked our way through these questions, and I'm going to tell you about uh, three of them today, so uh, basically just to go, go, walk you through these, these things that we did. So first we build uh, a large uh, network model of the regulatory network that controls the activity differentiation over time. Uh, and then we focus on the question of stability uh, and try to uh, build the model of the signaling regulatory network or pathway that is actually downstream of IL-23. Uh, then we have this uh, collaboration with the pharmaceutical company where we uh, Tested the, uh, the effects of drugs, specific drugs against our RBMT, and see the effect of these different molecules uh, on the network of TH17 differentiation. And it was interesting because actually different molecules have different effects uh, on the network, uh, um, uh, even though all of them in, in the end lead to uh, uh, decrease in, in, in inflammation. Uh, and finally, I'm going to talk about how we can tease out different subtypes of TH17 cells and see if we can actually isolate the pathogenic uh, TH17 cells from the non-pathogenic one. And this is done using single cell uh, RNA sequencing. So I'm going to tell you about uh, stories one, two, and four. So let's start with the, with the first story. So this is a bird's eye view of, of our approach. Uh, I'm just reminding you what we're going to do is to construct a, a, a temporal network that describes how uh, the TH17 differentiation process is regulated starting from like one hour after we, we, we started, we, uh, we induced the differentiation until like three days uh, later. So uh, this is a bird's eye view of our approach. Uh, we start by collecting a uh, time course gene expression data as we follow the cells as they differentiate from the naive state into TH17. 
Then, uh, based on this data, we create a regulatory network model that describes uh, uh, how, how these uh, uh, expression changes are being regulated. And then, in order to understand the function of this network and to validate this network, we design a set of uh, experiments, of perturbation experiments, where we knock out selected genes from the network and measure their effects on gene expression. And then we can actually roll back and look at these uh, uh, experimental data and then try to build to substantiate our model and try to maybe improve it a little bit and, and come up with very specific circuits that describe uh, various aspects of gene selective differentiation. So uh, walk you through this process. So uh, as I said, we measure gene expression data. Uh, as we find in the cells, half an hour after the differentiation, up to three days. And as control, we use uh, TA0 cells, which are basically uh, naive pieces that have been activated, uh, but not, uh, not treated with any additional cytokines. Uh, and when we compare these uh, two time courses, we find about 1,300 genes that are differentially expressed, and they exhibit very uh, diverse spectrum of, of uh, temporal profiles. Now, uh, without going into details, uh, we found these differentially expressed genes using a consensus of the, uh, several uh, statistical methods for differential expression. And this is just one of them. So let's say we want to compare this time course uh, to that time course. So instead of comparing them directly, what we do is to fit uh, a mathematical model to fit the curve uh, to each one of these time courses. And then what we do is actually, instead of comparing the actual data, we're comparing the, the fitted uh, curves. Uh, and this actually has uh, several advantages. So first of all, it's, it's very robust to transient fluctuations in the data. Um, uh, and it's, it's actually, if you want to impute some data, it's, it's, it can be a good tool. Uh, and um, we actually also use this continuous representation of the time course in the later class. I'm going to talk about just in two slides. So uh, we have our differentially expressed genes. And now what we want to do is to understand how these genes regulate. Um, so uh, in order to identify the regulators that drive these, uh, these temporal profiles, we cross our time course data with a database of potential protein DNA interactions. So it can come from, it's a big database that comes from ChIP-seq uh, experiments, from a, a motif analysis, from interactions that are inferred based on correlations in, in, uh, uh, in mRNA levels, and even IPA. I know that uh, there is some IPA talk here later, so you know, we also use IPA here. So, and just to illustrate how this process works, so just imagine we have ChIP-seq data for our MMT that uh, significantly overlap with a cluster of late induced genes. Now, if this overlap is, is significant enough, we're just going to connect in the network, we're going to connect our organity to, um, to its binding targets that are also a member of this late induced cluster. So, so far it's, it's pretty straightforward, uh, but the question is when do these interactions actually occur? So what we want to do is basically place a timestamp on every interaction, and we do that by looking only at time points where the target gene is that something happens to the target gene. It's either induced or oppressed or differentially expressed. But we also want to require sufficient amounts of the uh, regulatory protein. Now, since we only have uh, gene expression profiles in our hands, we need at least some computational way to at least crudely estimate when do we have sufficient amounts of protein. And we do this by combining these uh, different uh, models here. So uh, one model is a continuous representation of the mRNA profiles like I showed you before. The second one is the prediction of protein half-life, and the third model uh, is an ODE model to basically take these two and combine them together to predict protein abundance. Uh, and just as an example, uh, the model predicted that our gamma T reaches uh, sufficient levels of protein after about 20 hours, which exactly coincides with the time of induction of its known target genes like I17 and other T17 signature molecules. And we can see that this prediction is actually very nicely violated with the FOX analysis. So now with these uh, timestamps, uh, using these estimates, we could now infer for each time point which, is the, uh, which are the regulatory interactions that are actually uh, taking place during that time point. And altogether, we are getting this, this smoothly evolving model of 18 networks, one per each time point, uh, that describe uh, the regulatory landscape, I guess, uh, 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 throughout the differentiation process. Now, looking at this model, uh, we were actually uh, uh, encouraged because it's it recapitulates a lot of the known biology on t differentiation, which was, which was a good scientific check. So for example, the, the early networks 
contain uh, known early induced factors like uh, IRF1 and STAT1 that are predicted to cross-regulate each other and together control the induction of early induced genes. And then if, uh, another example is the transition, the master uh, regulator, our gamma T, is only active at the later stage uh, of the differentiation, uh, and only present at the late uh, stage networks. And this is in contrast to uh, the pioneer factors like STAT1 and IRF4, I'm sorry, like, uh, like STAT3, IRF4, and VATF that are actually present throughout the differentiation process. So these are all nice examples, but what was more interesting in this network, and more important, I guess, is the fact that it's over 50% of the regulators in this network are completely immune to TH17 biology. So that was a very uh, good uh, property that allowed us to address the next question that we have in mind, the key question, which is which perturbations we can do in order to disturb the differentiation process. So we treat it as a classification task, okay? Uh, the classification should be will or will not have effect on TH17 differentiation. And the, and the features that we have are, we have these two sets of features. One describes the temporal activity of a regulator node in the network. And the second one um, characterizes the expression of the encoding gene. And both of these features are actually highly predictive for genes that are, uh, that, that are already known to have an effect on TH17 differentiation. So we combine these two together created a red list of genes, and then we walked our way down the list and basically selected the top 40 genes in that list for follow-up analysis. And importantly, over 50% of these nodes that we selected, of the genes that we selected, are, are new to, to, uh, to the TH17 field. So uh, just to recap what we had so far, we started by uh, collecting this time course of gene expression data. We inferred this uh, uh, preliminary model of, of uh, regulatory interactions uh, during the time course, and then we use that in order to understand the function of this network. And to validate this network, we, de we designed this set of perturbation experiments, which we want to do now. So uh, in these follow-up experiments, what we do is we knock down each one of our selected uh, 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 genes. And there we use this uh, silicon nanowire technique. That's the only thing that worked in primary T cells. Uh, and then for each, each of these knockdowns, we measure the effect on the expression of, of a set of signature genes, about 300 genes in this cohort. Uh, and then we identify the cases where uh, the knockdown had a significant effect on the expression of genes, either up-regulated or down-regulated. So when we collapse all of these significant effects together, we get this blob here, uh, where a node A is connected to a node B if the perturbation of A had an effect on the expression of B. And the edge would be red if the effect is positive, meaning that B was down-regulated, and blue if the effect was negative, meaning that B was up-regulated. Yes. Yes, I already. Yes. Um, okay. So is that the question? Uh, all right. So uh, so now uh, we can just stretch our heads and look at this network and ask ourselves whether there is any structure in this network, whether we can find anything interesting in this network. Um, so we start our quest for uh, structure by uh, so of course there is a structure. Otherwise, I will show it to you. Uh, so we start our quest for structure by focusing on a small set of TH17 single genes. We then highlight all of, the, all of the genes that are positively connected to our TH17 signature genes, so like a TH17 positive module. And what we find is that uh, the, T, the TH17 positive module is negatively connected to signature genes from other CD4 positive T cell uh, uh, subsets, and specifically to FOXP3, which is the master regulator of the regulatory T cells. Now, when we look at the TH17 negative module, we see the mirror image with positive interactions with the uh, competing T cell lineages. And finally, when we uh, look inside the modules, we can see that both of these modules are tightly interconnected by positive interactions and interconnected by negative interactions. So, abstracting away the individual edges, what we find here is that we have this system of tension between two modalities. We have the TH17 positive module, we have the TH17 negative module that, that cross regulate that antagonize each other but promote themselves and have an opposite effect on, between, on the balance between TH17 cells and other uh, the competing uh, T cell lineages, and specifically between TH17 cells and regulatory T cells. Now, when I looked at it, uh, the image, it actually took me back to some work that I did in my PhD, and, um, and it makes, make us think that maybe what we see here might be more of a general principle that we will expect to see uh, in, in, in this kind of this type of biological uh, network, this like bi-stability kind of uh, uh, structure. 
So this work was done in NIST, uh, where we actually investigated a network which is exactly the same type of network, but much, much larger. It, is ba it has about 24,000 edges, and it's based on knockouts of over 200 genes. And what we find is that over 80% of this huge network can be completely explained by this very simple model of red versus blue, uh, that and these two modules. Uh, and just by observing uh, this very simple structure in the network, we actually designed very simple but very effective prediction algorithms for predicting the effect of knockouts. Uh, and this algorithm actually did much, much better than uh, previous methods that were much more complicated algorithmically, just because it, it, it puts the, the, the finger on that very simple structure that we have in the data. Uh, and there is actually, in, in this paper, we also looked at the cases that deviate from this linear behavior, uh, for this like uh, two set behavior, and that was actually an uh, interesting case for us to look at. I won't go into details here, I'll just say that it had to do with compensatory compensation mechanism uh, of the cell. Um, this is just another example from another paper from Ray Kishoni lab that, that showed similar kind of structure in the metabolic network also in this. So uh, going back to the 17 cells, uh, so this, this, uh, uh, this model that we have, um, so it highlights some of the logic behind the regulation of TH17 differentiation, but it also highlights uh, 12 genes that uh, we identified that were complete, so we, that we see the effect on TH17 differentiation, but they were completely new to the TH17 field. So obviously these genes were interesting for us to, to look at uh, more closely, which leads me to uh, the last part of this, uh, this project, where we actually go back and do another set of experiments uh, in order to really investigate uh, these, these new genes and really substantiate their, their role as, as, you know, as real effectors on the TSM team differentiation. And we use a, a slew of, of experimental methods like the RNA sequencing, chip seek, and a knockout mice, protein level analysis, and, and other, uh, other uh, types of uh, assays. And I'm going to show you some of these results in the next few slides. So, um, so this is just, yeah, this is just a, 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 some highlights from, from this specific study. And basically what we can see that uh, by overlaying this new experimental data uh, that we have on the edges from our regulatory network, we can actually identify and, and further really drill down into a number of novel circuits. Uh, uh, that are, and then we can actually also go back and see whether these specific circuits give us some hypothesis for this higher level functional question that we started up with. And this is just one example. Uh, so this is a circuit that is uh, uh, centered around the uh, chromatin regulator, uh, mean A, uh, uh, which is a member of the T17 positive module. So mean A is uh, predicted to have the, its effect to positive feedbacks with two of the main uh, transition factors in the T17 network, our gamma T and, and VATF. From here it also has a negative edge a, a, a suppressing effect on the expression of Fox B3. Uh, and what you can see is that um, uh, if you look at the knockout mice of, of mean A, you can actually it supports this, this, this model where we see a marked decrease in the uh, differentiation of TH17 cells, but we do see uh, a, a, a nice increase in the uh, abundance of uh, Fox B3. This, this is just a one quick example. I want to give you a bit more uh, in that example in the, uh, in the next study that I'm going to tell you about. Uh, and in this next study, we take basically we look more closely into one of the uh, one of the one as one of the aspects of this network, um, and uh, this is the uh, uh, basically number two on my list, which is a signaling uh, regulatory uh, signaling regulatory model of uh, signaling downstream of uh, uh, of IR22. So. Um, just to give you, uh, uh, just to remind you some of the things we talked about in the beginning, it is already known that a uh, signaling to IL-23 receptor is crucial for the stability of TH17 cells. So you can, you can view uh, the IL-23 receptor as, as a member of the, of the red module that we showed, that we uh, saw uh, in previous slides. So this is already known. Um, and this is just uh, uh, some data to show you that um, IL-23, uh, signaling to IL-23 is maybe not so important for the early steps of the differentiation, but it is important for the stability. Because if you are comparing these expression profiles between uh, wild type and IL-23 receptor knockout, we can see that after two days, which is here, the cells look more or less the same, but then if you wait another day, you can see that you are losing the TH17 phenotype, and you are starting to get some gain of the cytokines and the factors from the competing T-cell images. 
So all of these things is known. Actually, uh, IPv3 is one of the poster charts of uh, genome-wide association studies, a very, very famous paper that came out in, in science in 2006, 2005, that actually links uh, IPv3 uh, receptor uh, and other, actually other members of the IPv3 receptor pathway to uh, IDD. So, so uh, it's a very well established uh, uh, molecule, but what is not known is what is the mechanism, or how does the alpha 3 receptor signal actually propagate from the cell surface uh, to the nucleus, and actually uh, affect the transcription of, uh, of, uh, of genes. So that's a question that we have in our heads. Uh, and we address this question by uh, extending upon the, uh, the framework that we saw on, on previous slides. So we start by finding genes that are differentially expressed in alpha receptor knockout in the time course again. Then we identify the transition factors that are dysregulated in this process using the same method that, as I showed you before. And now what we want to do is to find the most uh, probable uh, pathways of protein-protein interaction that will connect alpha and receptor and some of the associated upstream molecules to these transition factors. So how do we do that? Um, so uh, basically, if we, uh, on our first stage we used a large database of protein DNA or potential protein DNA interaction to actually infer uh, these interactions here, so now we're going to use a second database of protein-protein interaction or potential protein-protein interaction to actually address the other layer of this, of this model. So uh, this is a large database, about 80,000 interactions uh, collected from the literature. Uh, and every interaction in this model, uh, in this database, is associated with confidence score, some number between 0 and 1, that says how much we believe that this interaction is, uh, is actually a true measurement, and this is just being learned automatically based on the experimental evidence behind that interaction. And now what we want to do is to extract from this large database the best network of a protein protein interaction that will, that will connect alpha and receptor and the associated molecules to our transition function. So now the question is, what is the definition of best? You can think about it in two ways. One is to say, I want alpha and receptor to be close, to be near uh, my uh, transition factors. So basically, I want the path to be short. Uh, so the algorithmic way to approach is basically finding shortest path. Um, so the advantage is that we that it is finding very you know the most uh, efficient way to to reach every transition factor individually. The disadvantage is that we ignore possible dependency between, between transition factors because we actually solve the problem separately for each one of them. The second problem is to, uh, the second approach is to say let's look at all of them together and find the overall uh, 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 most high confidence network that connects alpha and receptor to all of the transition factors together. So in computer science terms, it's called the Steiner tree problem, which unlike shortest path is an NP complete, but there is some uh, uh, good algorithms to solve it. So it's good because it takes into account the dependency between transition factors, but the problem is that it's very sensitive to uh, false positives in the data, uh, and it can also lead to very long path in some cases. There is actually, you can show uh, by just by mathematical ways that there is actually a very uh, nice trade-off between these two approaches. You can do very well here and very bad here and vice versa. So what we actually want to do is try to bridge the gap between these two approaches, and this is exactly what we did. So we developed this a algorithm that can actually find the sweet spot, the best uh, combination, the best compromise between these two uh, objective functions. Uh, and this is actually, um, uh, we can actually even prove it mathematically that it is guaranteed to give us the best uh, combination between these two, uh, approximately is the best combination between these two objectives. So uh, we implement this algorithm in a tool called the software tool called ANAT, which is used in various other systems, but now we also want to use ANAT uh, in i 23 So uh, we applied ANAT on the i 23 uh, expression network, and uh, uh, on the i 23 network, this is what we're getting here. So uh, in blue are the upstream nodes, the i 23 receptor and the associated molecules there. Uh, in green are the downstream transition factors, and the rest of the nodes are basically predicted by ANAT to act as mediators in this process. Uh, now, again, we can stretch our hands and look at this network and say, you know, what can I gain from this, from this uh, uh, ball of yarn? Uh, so one, one of the things that it can give us, it can give us ranking. Uh, we can actually basically rank the nodes in this network based on uh, how central they are uh, uh, in, in funneling the signal from i receptor. But one thing that we, we must be told is that we need to be very careful when doing this type of analysis. Because in this kind of large database, you can connect anything to anything to completely meaningless pathways. Uh, so there is uh, a lot of steps that we need to do, you know, to go from the theory of, you know, from graph theory to actual application uh, uh, 
uh, in these kind of cases. And one of the things is to assign statistical significance and basically say for each one of these mediators, how much would expect to see just by with random input. So we actually filter out all of these uh, spurious predictions from the network and only remain with the ones that we uh, trust. So uh, the, the most highly uh, ranked gene in this network is the protein kinase uh, SGK1. So SGK1 actually already caught our interest uh, based only on the gene expression data. Uh, we actually uh, uh, see that it's very strongly regulated by I23. So uh, basically it is very strongly down-regulated when we knock out I23, uh, and it is also very nicely overexpressed in, in the TNC routine differentiation. That, so it was already on our radar. And we, um, so what do we know about SGK1? So uh, we, it's a very important kinase. It plays an important role in, in stress response, in cell cycle, in apoptosis. Um, and another fact that I'm going to read down to in a couple of slides, that it also regulates sodium transport and homeostasis in the cell. Now, SGK1 uh, was not previously implicated in, in TH17 biology, but given all this mounting uh, body of evidence, we decided to look more closely into it. Uh, so using the SGK1 knockout mice, it actually became clear that it, it is essential for TH17 maintenance and for TH17 mediated autoimmunity. And specifically, we see that in vitro, TH17 signature genes are completely repressed in SGK1 knockout. But more importantly, uh, in vivo, we see that SGK1 deficient mice are resistant to uh, EAE, which is a mouse model of multiple sclerosis, specifically due to defects in, in TH17 maintenance. Uh, so now the question was, we found like one link in the path underneath of the I23 receptor, or one, one node. The question is, what is the mechanism? What is downstream of SGK1? So uh, to address this, we basically repeated the same analysis as before. This time, we are looking at SGK1. So we find the gene differential expressed under SGK1, find dysregulated transcription factors, and then do the protein-protein -port interaction analysis. Uh, and what we find in the end is this, uh, we kind of convert to this model. Uh, so this analysis actually highlights uh, another factor, which is the transcription factor of OXO1, as an important downstream target uh, of SGK1. And together, we get this logic here, where uh, FOXO1 normally acts as negative regulator of TH17 differentiation, for example, it binds directly to the I23 uh, promoter, and then if SGK1 can phosphorylate uh, FOXO1 and then basically deactivate its transitional activity. So in a sense, what you can see here is that we have this very indirect positive feedback between I23 receptor and SGK1, and this positive feedback is a characteristic of the uh, stable state of TH17 uh, cells. And we actually disturb this feedback either by knocking out SGK1 or by uh, messing with I23, we can actually lose the TH17 field. Um, so, um, I told you a couple of, just two slides ago that one of the known goals of uh, SGK1, uh, uh, one of the known goals in the literature is as regulator of, uh, of sodium channels, and it's actually also induced by sodium. So the natural question to ask was, what is the relationship between sodium and TH17 differentiation? Or what will happen if you just take naive T cells and culture them with elevated levels of salt? Uh, and what happens is that these cells actually differentiate into T17 cells. Um, and this happens both, and we see the evidence for that both in vivo and in vitro. Uh, and we can actually see that also in, in human T cells. That's an accompanying paper that came out from David Huffler's uh, lab. Uh, and what was a, a, another study that we did in, in vivo was to actually take mice and feed them with compare mice with high salt diet to mice with regular diet, and you can see that the mice with high salt diet actually develop much more severe uh, autoimmunity. Yeah, not all other samples. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, so basically, uh, you know, we are, so we are very careful you know, about, about um, uh, I mean, basically what it gives us is it gives us some sort of molecular level mechanism that explains the effects of this very high level uh, environmental factors such as high salt diet and autoimmunity. And this is just one hypothesis that one way by which this signal is, is mitigated is through uh, TH17 phenotype and specifically uh, through the activity of SGK1 because we see that we actually knock out SGK1, we lose the effect of uh, sodium. Uh, but of course we need to be very careful about making statements about how comprehensive this model is because Changing the uh, concentrations of salt can have 
a lot of effects on, on, the, uh, on the behavior of the cell. But this is, again, this is just uh, a good starting point to, you know, to start looking at this uh, very important uh, uh, effect that we see. And I can tell you that we already have an ongoing, uh, at least you know, in the uh, planning state, advanced planning state, um, large um, uh, experiments in, in human cohorts. We're trying to actually see the link between uh, diet and, and, and community and see, you know, uh, whether we can drill down and understand better the effects that we see here. If there was any question? Okay. Um, so so far we talked about um, we talked about how can we use um, uh, the variation of cells over time to actually do uh, intensive within differentiation in order to discern the, the mechanism uh, uh, behind the regulation of these cells. Um, so obviously, these cells change over time. The question is, what about variation between individual cells in, in a population of T817 cells? And uh, whether it is even interesting in the context of T817 cells? So the, the answer is, of course, yes. Otherwise, I wouldn't ask that question. But um, uh, there, this is actually, uh, 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 it is, Okay, I'll talk about this in a second. It's already been known that, that uh, term T817 cells, this is something that comes up in the literature in the, maybe the last two years, that the term T817 cells actually covers a very wide range of subtypes of cells. And this is a, a, a view that, that uh, I, I, I like this figure that came out uh, in this review paper from, from John O'Shea a couple of years ago that makes a very, um, I guess, a bold claim that if you know, you open the immunology textbook and you see the, can, the canonical T cell types that you have, you have TH1, TH2, TH17. But what actually happens when you look in vivo is all of these like creatures that lie in the middle between these canonical states, all of these double producers, all these cells that are actually somewhere on the spectrum between these canonical states. Um, and why is it important? Specifically, why is it important in our context? So it's important because we already know that these, these specific subtypes of TH17 cells can have very different pathogenic effects. Uh, this is a paper that we had a couple of years ago. We showed that uh, under some conditions, we can generate TH17 cells that are, can be very pathogenic in an adoptive transfer model, and others that can have uh, no effect at all. And this is something that we can see also in vivo. In some cases, we can see that uh, the TH17 cells are very pathogenic, and, and in some disease models, they, you know, they even produce immunosuppressive cytokines that are maybe considered to, to, uh, to actually act as the repressive uh, for the immune response. So um, what we'd actually like to do is to um, get a, a global understanding, a, a, an unbiased understanding of the subpopulation, the subset of the 17 cells, and specifically to identify this pathogenic subset of the 17 cells. And by identifying this pathogenic subset of T cells, wherever they lie on this spectrum, we're able to actually develop much more efficient uh, um, therapies against various autoimmunities that we are interested in. So uh, how do we do that? How can we, in an unbiased way, identify a subpopulation of T17 cells, which is supposedly you know, a homogeneous population of cells? So of course, the answer is uh, using uh, single-cell RNA sequencing. And that leads me to uh, the fourth and last uh, project that I'm going to talk, that I'm going to tell you about, which is how can we use single-cell gene expression data uh, to actually infer these, uh, and these subpopulations. Now, I should say that this is a, a unpublished work, uh, and this is kind of a still work in progress. Uh, so I would be happy to get you know any feedback from you on, on whatever I show you. That's this is really still in the making. So uh, that's how uh, this is how our data looks like. This is a huge matrix. We have about let's say about six thousand rows here. Each row is a gene, and about a thousand uh, columns here. Each column is a cell, uh, and we have uh, we, we collected cells both in vivo and in vitro. In vivo, it's in an EAE model at the peak of the disease, about two weeks after induction. And we have cells both from the, from the central nervous system and from the brain and lymph node. Uh, and from the uh, in vitro uh, uh, condition, we have uh, basically two cytokine treatments, one that leads to the uh, non-pathogenic T cells and the other one, the T817, and the other one that leads to the pathogenic T817. So an IL-16 plus TGF beta-1, this is the non-pathogenic, and IL-1 beta IL-6 IL-23, which is the, uh, the pathogenic T17. Uh, and again, the reason I call them pathogenic and non-pathogenic is just based on our results from adoptive transfer and, and experiments. 
So uh, now the question is, how can we tease out uh, the, the information from this matrix in order to, uh, to say something about subpopulation of these cells? So before we actually start addressing this, this question, uh, there is a lot of, of computational work to be done. A lot of things that we, that we need to think of. It's because this whole field of single cell transitomics is a very new field. Um, and uh, a very exciting time, I guess, to be a computational biologist because I, you know, it's a very new field, very important field, but may, a lot of open computational questions. And the reason this slide is so dense is because there is so much to do, I guess. Uh, and I just highlight here some of the, uh, of the interesting uh, tasks. And today I'm going to, in terms of the computational tasks that I'm going to show you, I'm going to talk about two of them. One is the more mundane but very important task of pre-processing the data, which can be extremely noisy, extremely problematic. And the second one is how can we infer subpopulation and actually understand these subpopulations. So uh, let's talk for a second about uh, pre-processing. I just want to make a point here uh, that this is something that I've seen in all of the single cell data sets that I've been working with so far, is that if you just, let's say we're doing RNA sequencing, let's say for like 200 cells, we're taking these 200 cells, uh, and we do, let's say, clustering, just as is, without touching the data, uh, the cluster that we get, or the positive components that we get, will reflect the biases in the, uh, we almost certainly reflect the biases in the library uh, efficiency, rather than anything that has to do with biology. So that means that we really need to make sure that we are filtering out all of these biases in the data before we do anything with it. Uh, and this is just a list of, of these, these uh, uh, um, measurements for library efficiency, like three to five prime bias, like complexity, like the number of transits that we can actually identify, number of reads, etc. So this is what I told you, but if you just take these, if you just take the data as it is, do principal component analysis, and correlate it with these parameters, we can see a huge uh, amount of correlation. So uh, we developed this pre-processing pipeline that actually composed of two steps. One is filtering cells that are not doing well in terms of these parameters. Uh, and the second one is actually uh, using a method that was previously used for removing GC content uh, uh, biases from RNA-seq data to actually, in a quantitative way, remove the, these biases, basically shave them off the matrix of data as well. And we see that after we do these uh, steps, we can actually lose these uh, correlation between our physical components and these different uh, covariates for the data. Another thing that we need to take into account is the very high level of false negatives in, in single cell data. Uh, and in some of the single cell papers that come out now, you can see that you know, in some cells you have like 100 transcripts, 1,000 transcripts. Of course, this is a, a fraction of the transcripts that are actually there in the cell. Uh, so basically, the fact that I do not see a gene in a, in a certain cell doesn't necessarily mean it's not there. It can be a false negative. So we need some way to actually uh, take this into account. So what we do is we build this characteristic curve of false negative rates for every individual cell. We are giving the expression level of a gene in the population. In the population, we can actually predict what is the uh, probability for false negative. So basically, all of the subsequent analysis that I will show you is weighted by these uh, uh, false negative estimates. So uh, now let's leave the pre-processing and go to the interesting part. Uh, so. Um, uh, when we look at the, uh, 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 the gene expression profiles of the different genes uh, across the different cells, and we look at the history of the genes, basically we get two types of genes. We have genes that are considerably expressed across all the cells, like you know, our other T, like BAPF, IRF4, etc., not surprising, and housekeeping genes. But then we have genes that are bimodally expressed. The, 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 some of the cells express them, and some don't. So basically, these genes are characteristic of subpopulations of cells. And when we look at these genes, we see some, some interesting cases here. We see IL-10, we see IL-17, we see even POPs B3. So, uh, and, so and there, is, there might be some important information here. So what we actually need to know is how do these genes actually co-vary with each other? Uh, and we look at how they co-vary with each other, we get this very nice uh, image, as you can see here. Basically what we see is that we have these two modules. So basically every, every column here is a gene, and uh, what we see here is the correlation of each gene with a, a small set of these signature genes that we have here. And we see that the genes in the genome are actually partitioned into two sets. The ones that positively correlate with IL-17 and negatively correlate with IL-10 or vice versa. So we basically see this, this, this uh, uh, antagonistic uh, structure between uh, IL-10 on one hand and IL-17 on the other hand. Or the non-pathogenic phenotype on one hand and the pathogenic phenotype on the other hand. 
And when we look at the principal component analysis of these, of these uh, TS17 cells, we can actually see uh, exactly the same picture, where we can have this very nice separation into uh, T cells that, that uh, have high levels of IL-17 and ones that do not have high levels of IL-17. And as you go to the right in this principal component map, uh, the cells on the, on, the, on the right side are uh, expressing, uh, are characterized by a very pathogenic signature, where the ones on the left are actually characterized by production of IL-10 and, and more, uh, uh, you know, non-pathogenic kind of signatures. Basically, we see this very nice spectrum of behavior between non-pathogenic TH17 cells on the left to pathogenic TH17 cells on the right. Now, the question is, what is the meaning of this uh, uh, spectrum of behavior that we see in, vi in vitro? What is the meaning of this spectrum in vitro? So I won't go uh, into the, the into, uh, I guess I have, I have 15 minutes, so I can tell you why. So, um, yeah, so, so, so basically what we see here is the spectrum of behavior of TH17 cells from a non-pathogenic uh, phenotype to a very pathogenic phenotype. Um, and now when we look in vivo, so I remind you, we, we profiled uh, T cells uh, from, uh, from, the, uh, from the lymph node and from the brain. Uh, and so when we look at the principal component analysis of these in vivo cells, we see a very nice separation between uh, the, uh, the, the brain cells and the one from the, from the lymph node. Um, but uh, which, which was nice to see uh, that, that, that we can actually separate them. But more importantly, what we see here that once again we have this kind of this. If we try to actually characterize these cells using additional information, we can see that we have this. As you go here from the left to the right, we see this spectrum of behavior again. As the cells from the left are more are characterized by a naive T cell like a phenotype and self-renewal phenotypes like wind signaling and TCF7 expression, whereas the cells on the right. Uh, are more characterized by terminal effector uh, 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 kind of profiles or memory profiles. So basically what we see, uh, the spectrum of behavior that we see here in vivo is agrees with that, uh, this, this image here that it's kind of a speculative image that came out in a review paper about a year ago that uh, basically uh, claims that we have this gradient of ability of capacity for self-renewal um, that actually decreases as you go from the precursor Precursor uh, T17 cells and actually decreases as you go uh, basically from these precursor cells to the cells that actually go to the site of inflammation. Um, and this is exactly what we see here. Basically, these are the precursor cells, and as you go from the lymph node to the brain, uh, where to the site of inflammation, you basically lose the capacity to self renewal and acquire all of these uh, effecto, uh, terminal effector uh, phenotypes, and also like a TH1 like phenotype that characterize the pathogenic activity of T17 cells. So uh, now the question is, what is the relation between this spectrum that we see here um, in vivo that basically uh, characterizes the, the activity of, of TH17 cells and how do they move from the lymph to the brain? How, how is this uh, spectrum here reflected in our uh, in vitro data? And we can actually see that it's reflected very well. If we're taking this axis here and actually project it into our PCA plot uh, uh, in vitro, this is what we're getting, so basically it means that uh, the cells that are here on the right side, which are the more pathogenic cells, they are also uh, characteristic by being on the right side here, basically being um, a characteristic of the terminal effector cells that are actually at the site of inflammation, that have the TH1 phenotype, and actually uh, induce uh, 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 the, 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 the inflammation in the EAE. So this gives us another uh, support for the spectrum of behavior that we see here, basically from this no pathogenic TH17 cells to, to the pathogenic TH17 cells, and we can interpret what is the meaning of this thing when we look at the in vivo model. So that's good. Now we can have this, we have this, uh, this uh, spectrum of cells, and now we can actually go back and make use of the fact that we have genome wide gene expression data and see if we can actually gain anything new by looking at this map. So what we basically want to do is try to compare the cells on the right to the cells on the left and ask what is the difference between them. And by looking at the differences between them, see if we can actually find hypotheses for new regulators that are specifically important for regulating the pathogenicity of TH17 cells. And that's exactly what we did. So basically, by comparing these, these two sets of, uh, of cells, we could identify a number of uh, novel regulators. We actually tested seven of them using a uh, local mice. And for four of these cases, we could actually find very, very strong phenotype on TH17 function. And this is just one example. Uh, it's the G-cup reporting the set of 65. Um, 
is a glycostimulated lipid uh, um, a receptor that uh, um, uh, we can see uh, a very specific effect uh, on, on pathogenic TH17 cells. So this is just an example for an EAE model where we see that the GPR65 robot mice do not develop the disease at all. And this is just in vitro analysis where we can see that the uh, effect of uh, the GPR65 knockout is the most pronounced in the pathogenic, uh, sub, in the pathogenic subset of, of, of the 17 cells. Um, so that gives us, the, the, gives us actually the complete some uh, previous uh, hints that came out from the literature, some of them based on genetic data, and give us some potential mechanism for why and how GPR65 is important for regulating uh, TH17. So, uh, yes. Yes. By the way, it is interesting. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, um, yeah. so just to summarize. Um, so, I showed you a bunch of, of methods that we have. Basically, we, um, we can see how we can, using time, time of the special data, we can construct uh, a, uh, a, a temporal model of the wiring networks. <coughs> how we use it for, for TH17 differentiation. Um, we extended this, this uh, method to actually also build a signal in there on top of the, uh, uh, of the um, regulatory networks and we applied it on the alpha receptor. Um, and then uh, we have this uh, a bunch of computational tools that we developed for analysis of single cell data. Uh, in terms of mechanism, this analysis, we actually found um, a, a number of, uh, of, of new hypotheses. One is this bistable model of the 17 differentiation that I showed you, uh, this new signaling pathway downstream of I23, um, and the sodium effect on, on the 17 differentiation, and the different subpopulation of, of the 17 cells. Um, in terms of the function, this kind of, this kind of mechanistic things that we found gave us some hypotheses for, these, for the function type question that we started up with about how the balance is maintained between regulatory T cells and TH17 cells, for example, through mean A, or about the stability of TH17 cells, for example, through this uh, SGK1 FOX01 pathway, or about uh, what, makes this, what, what makes these cells uh, pathogenic. So, for example, here we had this um, uh, uh, GPR65 and other results that we have from the single cell data. And about the application, so I can tell you that we already have some, uh, some encouraging results in vitro for small molecules against like SGK1. And the study that I didn't tell you about today about uh, small molecules that target our gamma T, uh, which, we just, uh, which we just published. So um, this, just to acknowledge the people that were involved, so all of these studies were done at the Broad Institute at Howard Medical School. My uh, previous uh, postdoc advisor, uh, Abi Breger of the Broad, VJ Kuchu uh, at Harvard. Chuan Hu and Teresa Talmer are, are uh, postdocs uh, at Vijay's lab that work on the SGK1 project. Um, Hong Kong Park is our collaborators at chemistry and physics at Harvard, and his students, uh, Yael Bloom and Alex Shelek, uh, were involved in the single cell uh, experiment and a uh, project and the first project of the uh, uh, temporal uh, regulatory network of the HCRT differentiation. And with that, I will conclude. Thank you very much. The question was if we had experimental data to support the or to use for the protein abundance model uh, in the first network model that I showed. So we did, um, there was one experiment we did with our DMT that I showed and uh, uh, basically measured the abundance in several time points. Uh, and what we see using this, this hard analysis actually supports uh, what the model predicts. Um, so that's the one thing that we have. We didn't have additional protein level information there. I can only say that we try to be very conservative about it, using this model. Um, and in a sense, 
try to more to be to, to exclude things than try to go more strongly on the first negative than on the first positive. I guess uh, there in terms of like you know presence and protein. So basically, we're just trying to be more conservative because it is very hard to make these kind of predictions. No, it doesn't. Yeah. So the question whether the model uh, incorporates post post transcriptional uh, uh, post yeah post translational or probably also post translational. No, it doesn't. Uh, and there is definitely um, it, it can definitely be taken into account. There are additional types of data that we that we probably need to have in order to do that, which we didn't have in this case. But I can tell you that this is definitely something that people are thinking about these days uh, at you know at the at the broad yeah. You mean in the single cell? Then when we go down, so we can see basically 
you know, everywhere we look, we see our gamati, as you can see here. But then we have these, these subtypes of cells that are characterized by the genes in the upper part of this map. And one of them is that 17 age. Maybe one last quick question. I'm actually following up on this discussion. I was wondering, in this, uh, those two subpopulations, the IL-10, the more IL-10 leaning uh, subset of these something, how are they in expression of regulatory factors and FOXP3 and you know, how close are they to t -Rex? Um, so that's a good question. We don't see um, a strong T-Rex signature there. Uh, it might be a result of false negatives that we just can't, uh, because you know, false negative, for example, is kind of lowly expressed, kind of hard to catch. Uh, but we do see a nice module of you know, immunosuppressive side. So we see I-9 and I-24 and I-10. So that, uh, so as a, you know, as a whole, it makes sense to us. We, um, there are tons of words we actually saw a couple of them this week. This shift of IL-17 and T-Rex and Fox-P3 versus our organities, they're very tight, mutually regulating each other. It's like you turn one off, then the other one also switches on from... Yeah. That it might be that you're seeing here a shift towards a T-Rex population of so much as a subset of T-Rex. It might be, but, but uh, let's say that we cannot say that based on the data. Mm -hmm.